Hi, I'm Gary Katz. I want to thank all the folks who bought copies of my DVD programs over the last 20 years. If it wasn't for their support and the support of companies like Windsor One and Stabila, I never would have been able to produce what turned out to be a 10 program series on mastering finished carpentry. Those 12 to 20 year old videos look pretty terrible compared to streaming video today. And that's why I'm no longer selling the DVDs, but the carpentry techniques haven't aged much at all. And that's why I'm making them available here for free. Enjoy. Now, the next thing to do is to put this last panel back in. And it should fit right back in because we haven't changed the dimension here. It's still the same size and there it goes. And we can tack this to the wall and it fits up snug against this one. And it's right on our mark from our laser line here. And this corner here could come up just a little bit so it's flush with the top of the back band there. And you probably noticed that I've nailed this to the wall and I didn't put the panels on the inside of it yet. Well, let's do something a little different here. Rather than rabbit out the backs of all of these panels before I install this frame, I went ahead and tacked the frame right to the wall. We're not going to do no mold craftsman styles panel here, paneling here. I'm going to finish each one of these little panel openings with a slightly different style of molding and paneling just so we can experiment with a few more traditional styles. This really low wainscoting is actually better suited to a colonial home anyway. As I mentioned before, chair rail heights in colonial homes were often set to continue the window stool, and that's pretty much what this elevation is. At the John Brown House in Providence, Rhode Island, the upstairs wainscoting was too high to match the sills of the Palladian windows. Look closely at the right corner and you'll see how the carpenters used an easing to bring the chair rail height back down to the window sills. Panels and panel molding for wainscoting this low should mimic those styles, which were mostly influenced by Georgian homes of the late 18th century. Now let's look at the John Brown house again. Notice how the wainscoting in the downstairs hall is low. The raised panels are long rectangles. The height of this wainscoting matches the height of the windows on the first floor. Directly across the street from the John Brown house is the Nightingale Brown home. The wainscoting in that home is similarly low and the panels flanking the mantelpiece are long. In this example, the carpenters installed flat panels with decorative moldings. While I'm here, let's pick up a couple of measurements. These measurements should work for any type of different panel we want to put in here and we're going to use several of them. It measures 13 inches wide, so we'll make that 12 and 7 eighths. And 19 inches tall, so we'll make them 18 and 7 eighths. Exactly. And let's use some rabbited panel molding first. I've got a piece of it here. This is a piece that I've used on a lot of different jobs. This molding works really well when you're using 3 quarter inch styles and rails and quarter inch flat panels or even a raised panel with a quarter inch edge because the molding has a half inch rabbit right on the back edge of it. Rabbited panel molding is perfect if you're installing stain grade wainscoting too. You can use MDF with a hardwood veneer like cherry, oak, or mahogany for the wainscoting styles and rails and the flat panels. Then the only solid wood you have to buy is the panel molding. Veneered sheet material is much less expensive than solid wood and you'll save part of a hardwood tree too. Rabbited panel molding is easy to install, which makes paneling a whole room, the walls, the ceilings, everything, a lot more profitable and a lot more enjoyable. Let me show you what this looks like on the wall. The rabbit sits right on top of the style like this and the panel molding drops down onto the quarter inch panel. So it gives you a really nice bit of relief here, a really good three-dimensional look. If you can't find rabbited panel molding at your local molding dealer, you can make your own rabbited panel molding too. I often use backband molding from Windsor One's classical colonial style, and this is a nice profile too. And if you're using their casing, you can tie a thread from the panel molding to the backband around the windows and doors. 
Before cutting the rabbit, I like to put a slight bead on the back edge of this. A little cove bit does a really nice job, and we'll do that right now at my work table over here. This little cove bit that I've got in this router here, again, it's got a bearing guide on it, so you don't really need any fancy setups to do this. It's gonna do a nice little job. I'm just gonna clamp this down briefly. And that's all we were after. So it'll have some kind of a decorative edge on the back as well as the front after we rabbit out this back shoulder. Now I can cut this rabbit on my table saw. To cut this rabbit, I'm gonna set my table saw exactly a half inch from the fence to the outside of the blade over here. Like so. And then I'm gonna drop the blade so it's exactly a half inch above the table. And with that kind of a setup, I can make both cuts without changing anything, neither the blade nor the fence location. Here's the bead, and here's the rabbit on the back, and here's the raw edge, the clean edge that was never cut. So there's our piece, and now I'm ready to cut it on a miter saw. Cutting rabbited panel molding like this can be confusing because the point you have to measure to and cut to is underneath the material down here. When you're cutting panel molding, you're always cutting to the long point to long point measurements. That's because the molding goes around the inside of a frame. With casing, you're always cutting to the short point measurements because the molding goes around the outside of the frame. For this panel molding, we don't measure to the longest point of the miter. Let me show you what I mean. We don't measure to this point out here. We measure and we cut to this long point down here underneath the molding at the long point of the rabbit. Rabbited panel molding sits on top of the face frame and projects beyond the inside panel measurement. The actual panel measurement must be taken here at the long point of the molding where it crosses the rabbit beneath the molding. To make it easier to measure these pieces, I set this jig up on my miter saw. It's just a piece of half-inch anything, MDF, plywood, whatever works for you. And I position the jig near the fence, but far enough away from it so the molding will slide between the jig and the fence. And I'll pull it away just a hair, just to make sure it's not going to bind it up. And then I'll clamp that down. Before I start cutting, I swing the saw to the right, and we're already swung to the right. And I make a curve right there at 45 degrees. I'm going to label that cut number one. Now I'm going to swing the saw to 45 degrees in the opposite direction and make another miter. And we'll label this one number two. In a minute, you're going to find out why these labels are so important. I swing the saw to the number one position and I cut the first miter. I've already done that, but we'll clean that up just in case. There we go. Now we've got a clean cut. 
So I don't get confused, and to get the saw out of my way, I'm going to swing the saw to position number two. Okay, now we got to take a measurement. I don't do any of this fancy math to figure out the exact length of this piece. Obviously, we've got to make a mark on the top of the molding, and we're going to have to do some math to figure out how long the rabbit is and add it to itself or something and transfer some kind of measurement mark up here by measuring off this long point or something. I don't do any of that. I hold this piece of molding flush with the end of this little jig, and I'm not holding it flush to this point, to this long point on top. I'm holding it flush to the real long point, the one I have to measure to, which is down here on the rabbit. So I'll take my finger and I'll put it down here and feel when that long point comes up flush with the jig, and that's where I'm going to hold it. Now it's easy to measure how long the rabbit is. First, I'll take my tape measure and turn it around and I can see that rabbit isn't quite a half an inch, it's more like 7 sixteenths. So that means I have to add 7 sixteenths to the measurement I wanted. Now the shortest piece that we measured over there was 12 and 7 eighths. So I'm going to hook my tape measure right onto the jig here. I'm going to pull the 12 and 7 eighths measurement and make a mark at 12 and 7 eighths. Then I'm going to slide my tape to the nearest full inch and make another mark at 7 sixteenths from there. So I have two marks here, and I want to cut to the longer one. It's easy to cut that miter right on. All I have to do is line up that mark with the kerf in my jig here. So I'm going to slide the second measurement mark right up to the edge of the kerf here and make that cut. Now. Before I cut any more of these pieces, I want to be sure they all fit correctly. So I'm going to go over to the panel and check it. Perfect. About an eighth of an inch short. Exactly what we wanted. Now I'm going to put it back in the saw. I'm going to slide it up to that kerf where the saw cut it. And I'm going to make a mark right back here. Right at the long point. That mark is a repetitive stop position. Now all we have to do is swing the saw to position number one, cut the miter fresh, move the long point to the mark we've made for the repetitive stop, swing to position number two, and that's our second piece. Now let's cut the first long one, for the 18 inch, it was 18 and 7 eighths. There's the first miter. Now we've got to measure this one, so we'll slide it out here past the jig and make it flush again. We already know it's hanging past 7 sixteenths because we measured that when we did the short piece. And this one's 18 and 7 eighths, so I'll mark it right here and I'll slide my tape measure to the nearest one inch mark and add 7 sixteenths right there. So that's the mark we want to cut to and I'll transfer that line down to the bottom of the molding like so and then put that line right on the kerf here. So we're going to cut right to there. Let me check this piece and make sure it's the right length too before we set up a repetitive stop. Perfect again. Exactly an eighth of an inch. That's precisely what we wanted. So we'll just put this piece in and line it up right with the kerf. I don't have to bring the blade down. And then we'll bring this stop down and slide it into position here and tighten it up. And now we're all set to cut repetitive pieces that length. So here's another piece. We'll have to cut position number one first. And then we'll slide it right up to the stop and cut the second cut.
So that's the last of the four pieces we need. You're going to find that you need at least four flip stops, three or four flip stops for panel molding and casing when you're casing different sized doors. I mean, there's so many repetitive jobs we do. Sometimes, though, these pieces of molding, like you saw, are so short, they won't reach the flip stop. You know, you can always take another piece of wood, like a narrow piece, and cut it to fit from the flip stop up to your long point measurement or your short point measurement, or go ahead and make a mark like I did here. The great thing about setting up a process like this is that you can pass the job off to your apprentice carpenters. It's a perfect way for a new carpenter to get used to a miter saw, and all the pieces are going to fit perfectly. Let's look at the next step, because your apprentice carpenter should be doing almost everything from this point on. That opening measured 12 and 7 eighths by 18 and 7 eighths, and I've already cut a panel for it out of the same pre-finished material. But rather than fasten the panel directly to the wall, then fit each piece of molding one at a time around the frame, you know what I'm talking about? I've seen a lot of carpenters still installing panel molding that way because that's the way it's always been done. But it's time consuming and never as precise as pre-assembling the moldings. When you install the panel molding first, then the moldings one piece at a time, you're at the mercy of the wall. If the wall has the slightest bow or belly, the miters won't be tight. The first one might be good, and the second one's probably going to be okay, but the third one probably won't be, and the fourth one, well, I think you know what I'm talking about. By the time you get to the fourth one, it's usually too late. You've already nailed the piece in place. And if the wall has a bow or a belly, sometimes it's really hard to keep the rabbited molding tight against the face frame and tight against the panel too. Pre-assembling moldings is possible now because we have nail guns and spring clamps and all kinds of great adhesives. So it's a dream method for installing panels and panel, and panel molding. The first thing I'm going to do is glue up a couple of these pieces of molding. I glue up the miters first, and then I'll just flip the piece around and glue up the other side of this miter at the same time. Let's do a couple of these. I'll do this long one here too. I like to spread the glue on each piece so the stain won't creep around if it's stain grade. We were talking about that before and wick into the end grain and darken the miter. And then I use Collins spring clamps. I'll take these two pieces and put them together. I use Collins spring clamps to put these things together. These clamps are really handy. The points have really, really sharp tips on them, and they swivel up out of the way. You'll see in a second when I want to put my nail gun on. And we can turn this whole thing upside down now so we can access the rabbits from the back. I'm going to use a 23 gauge pin nailer to secure these miters with one inch pins. You could use one inch brads too. You could use 18 gauge brads and that's what I did before I got my hands on this gun. This is like a, this is the same gun I told you about before. It's that Kadex pin nailer. It shoots brads and headless pins but I'm just going to use the regular headless pins on this and I'll flush the back of this up, swing the spring clamp up out of my way, and fire some pins right through the back of this miter. And I, I can put a few of them in there, and they won't split that wood. That's the, one of the nice things about using pins. I'm just going to adjust this miter a little bit, make sure it's flat.
And if you get a little shiner like that in the, that comes up through the back of the molding, bend it back and forth like this a couple of times, and it'll snap off. Even if it comes through the face of the molding, it'll snap off right underneath the wood. Here's the, what's left of the pin. It'll snap off right underneath the wood. So you don't have to put a nail set on it and hit at it. <laughs> Make a bigger mess. So we'll swing this one up out of the way. Nail these together. And the same with this joint. Push that down so it's flush. Adjust that miter a little bit back here. And that'll be enough to hold those together. These clamps, you can see how handy these clamps are. They're made by David Collins, the same fellow that makes the Collins coping foot, and you can find his website online at collinstool.com. They're not that expensive, but um, if you go to buy these, don't think the first time you start using them that you can use them with just your, just your hand. I mean, you can open them up like this if you squeeze on them real hard, but I want to tell you something. When you're using these clamps, a lot of times you're working on crown molding, and you put them on the back of the crown, and they're at an angle when they're on the back of the crown, and when you're fooling around with them, and they're on an angle on the crown, and you're wiggling them around to get the nail gun in, sometimes they'll pop off of that molding if they're on the back of the crown. And when they do, they only land one place. They always land right on your thumb. So make sure you buy the wrench, because when one of these things lands on your thumb or your finger, I don't know what happens, but all of a sudden you're just, you have no strength in your hand at all. You wouldn't be able to open this wrench up if your life depended on it. You're going to need that wrench and you're going to need it right away. So get the wrench too. They're really handy. They help you pre-assemble everything from panel molding to crown molding to just about anything. And pre-assembling molding these days is the real trick. With the miters glued intact, I flip the frame over and I can glue the back of the panel on. Before I do though, I want to clean up some of this squeeze out. So I've got a little wet rag here. And you know what else works really good is a little toothbrush and a little jar of water so you can get inside of these miters and clean them up really good. But now's the time to do it before that glue sets. And now I'll flip this over and I'll run a bead of glue right around the back of the panel here just a little bead all the way around the back edge. I don't want to run this too close to the front because if it squeezes out I don't want too much of it to get on the face of the panel. And now I can take the panel and lay it down with the good face down. Yeah, I pre-assembled the panel to the molding too so there won't be any gaps between the molding and the panel. You know, if there's irregularities in the wall, you could end up with gaps between the molding and the panel. And that glue's back there for a good reason, because it's definitely going to squeeze out. Now here's a kind of a fun thing. If you notice here, the rabbit is practically, almost perfectly flush to the back of this panel. All I have to do is line this all up, and I'm going to go ahead and use this stapler to attach the panel. And I'll get these corners first. Staple that on there really good. One more like right in here. And now we're ready to stick this in. Let me switch guns here. It fits perfectly, but before putting this panel into place, always squeeze a few balls of liquid nails onto these panels. Use it as adhesive and as a shim, and that way the adhesive will absorb any irregularity in the wall and prevent the panel from being kicked in off the molding. The beauty of using rabbited panel molding like this is, you know, some people call it bolection molding, and it's because it sits proud of the face frame and it covers up 
a whole lot of small sins, like MDF edges. If you're doing stain grade work and these edges are, are raw MDF, the rabbited panel molding will cover that up. And it hides little variations, minor variations in panel sizes and measurement mistakes, small ones. When you're using rabbited panel molding, you can definitely make all your panels and panel frames ahead of time exactly the same size, especially if you use a calculator to lay out your face frames. Now, let me nail this in here so we can leave it in place. Now, I've got two styles of moldings, two other styles I want to talk about, so let's do some recessed panel molding next. First, I want to make a little bit more elaborate panel than this one. We're going to make some raised panels for, the, for that opening right there. Actually, we'll make some raised panels for a couple of them, but I just want to demonstrate how to do this. I don't make raised panels that often in my shop. I really usually call a cabinet chopper, a millery, and have them run on a CNC machine. But sometimes you have to make custom sizes. And so I've got the router set up here and the router table from Rousseau to, set to make these cuts. The panel sizes that we're going to make are about the same size. That opening's about 13 by 19. So we're going to make them 12 and 7 eighths by 18 and 7 eighths. And since they're paint grade, I'm going to make them out of MDF. Now, there's no grain with MDF. I don't like this stuff very much, but you, know, you don't have to worry about which way you feed the panel through. It cuts very smooth. It paints out really slick. When I'm cutting solid wood panels, I like to cut the end grain first, and then when I cut with the grain, it cleans up the end grain, but any tear out from the end grain. But the real trick to using power tools and cutting wood precisely is the setup. And that's what I want to show you here. This operation is proof of how important setup is. Most commercial shops use a shaper for cutting panels, but I, like I said, I don't do it often. So I use a router mounted in a Rousseau router table with a good hold down system. This hold down here not only holds the workpiece flat against the table, but it also acts as a featherboard. The wheels are angled and they push the workpiece snug up against the fence as I'm making each pass. The MDF is pretty soft. If you push a piece through the work, if you push the workpiece through the cutter slowly, you can almost make the cut in one pass. But it's a big bite to take with this cutter head. I've got a pretty big molding head on here, and it'd be kind of a big, big bite to try and chew at one pass. And I definitely wouldn't try that with a solid wood panel. With solid wood, make at least two or three passes. The last one should be really shallow, just deep enough to clean the rough cuts so you end up with a panel that requires hardly any sanding. You don't want to have to sand these very much. Now the cutter I'm using is a craftsman style cutter. It cuts a chamfered profile. I want to cut the panel deep enough so that the tail edge here is about a quarter of an inch, which is the same thickness as the flat panels I was using. And that way I'll have room for a half inch panel molding around the styles and rails. Making raised panels isn't that tough, though sometimes they get a little tricky. Well, before we get to that, let's cut one of these, just a regular old square panel, and we'll make a few passes here. This push stick I made, it's not just to push the material through the big router bit here, it's also to stop the sawdust from shooting out 
right alongside the chamfer on the panel here. I'm raising that panel and taking the edge off. And once you've cut the, made the first pass all the way around, as you push your piece through for successive passes, the sawdust shoots right out the back edge of that panel. And it could cover this window in just a matter of minutes. So using this push stick also stops the sawdust and it makes it, it helps the dust collector collect most of the sawdust that's coming out of here. Now what I'll do is, I'll bring that bit up, a few turns, and take a second pass. I'll show you what I mean. Not too bad, it didn't get too dusty in here. So we got our panels and they're cut pretty close here. Just a tiny bit of sanding, got a nice, just took a little bit off at the very end there. The last pass was pretty thin. All it requires is a little sanding and some priming. You know, we installed wainscoting panels on one job that wrapped around a window seat. You can't shape a panel in a dog leg shape. So we had to make two panels and we mitered them together. Narrow panels like these two are easy to cut on a miter saw. We use biscuits to reinforce the miter. To miter wide panels like this, I use my MFT table. I used to do this a variety of ways and none of them were nearly as accurate or as easy as using this table. First, you'll see I've got this fence already set at 45 degrees to my guide rail. All I have to do is pick the guide rail up and set one of these panels in here. And I've got the flip stop adjusted to exactly the height I want to cut this panel off at. So I'll cut the first panel. And then when I cut the second one, I'll turn it upside down. Now we're going to be going 3 quarters of an inch. So I've already got this set right. So I'm cutting at the right depth. And it looks like we're ready to go. So there's one half of it. I'll set this right here. And now I'll cut the second half. Now I'm going to turn this upside down to make the second cut. And slip it in. And I just want to make sure it's up against the stop and up against the guide, up against the fence. And the guide's going to hold it, hold it down because of the way I have the, the guide adjusted for this three-quarter inch stock. mitered panel for a dog leg frame just like you saw in the photograph of that wainscoting around that window seat. 
I wouldn't even attempt to do this if this was solid wood because it would probably move. I'll talk more about that in a second, but I'm going to use dominoes in just a second to reinforce this miter and I'll show you how to do that next. I'm going to attach these cross stops to my domino which extends the indexing pins. Each one of these has another indexing pin in it and allows me to space the mortises farther apart. I'm going to just lift up the tool and drop it on top of these. They kind of fit into a little dovetail and then turn the lever. And the same on this side. Just set the tool right down on top of the cross stop and turn the lever and it's right in there. And I'm going to set these so that they're both the same. I'm going to put it right on, a, on the 150 mark here. And I'll make sure this one is exactly the same. And it's the inside mark here, the inside index that's on 150 on both of these. So both of these stops are precisely the same distance from each other and from the center of the bit. So now, the first mortise that I'm going to cut here, I'm going to index. I'll turn these upside down. The first mortise I'll have to index off of the long point on this piece. And the second one, when I cut it, I'll index off the long point on the opposite end. So I'll take my Craig clamp and hold this down, get it secured real well. I'm going to be using these small dominoes, which is this setting on the tool here. The first mortises, I'm going to index off this edge of the miter. So the pin right here is going to be right on the edge touching the miter and I almost have to put my finger there because the edge here is only a quarter of an inch thick and that should hold it. Now the second mortise I'm going to put that pin right inside the first mortise and slide the tool over. That'll get me indexed for the second mortise. That's great. Perfect. I'll just put two mortises into this. We could put more. I could set these pins even closer and put three or four across here. Now, for this second panel, Put it in. I'm going to cut the mortises in the second piece wider than the domino tenon so I'll have a little extra wiggle room just in case the pin isn't indexed perfectly on the edge of this miter. To do that all I have to do is take this switch right here and turn it to the second position. It's really meant for the next size tenon but it works for this application too. Now I'll cut the mortises in the second panel and I'll have to index off this end of the miter. And it's the same thing. Just make sure that the pin is right on the edge of that miter. It's the first one that really counts there. And then slide it forward until that pin engages the first mortise and is right up against the shoulder and hold this flat. And these are just a little bit wider. And you can see there's a little bit of wiggle room between the shoulders on the mortise. But they're snug in the other direction, so they'll register these pieces together perfectly flat. And there we are. See how I was able to slide it up and back a little bit to get the miter register right? And there's the joint. It's perfectly flat across here. Probably needs maybe 220 sandpaper, and that's about it. These panels are made from MDF. If I glue them up really well and, and reinforce this miter the way I'm doing, the joint probably won't crack. If it does, here in Southern California, the crack won't open. With solid wood, this miter is a little more risky. If you live somewhere like the Northeast where the humidity and temperature changes dramatically from one season to the next, then I wouldn't recommend a joint like this in such a wide piece of stock. Remember, um, solid wood moves a lot more than MDF does, especially in areas of high humidity. 
It doesn't move much with the grain, so that would be in this direction, but it swells and contracts big time across the grain. Some species of wood swells even more and contracts a lot more too. When you cut a miter in a piece of wood, it's critical to anticipate future wood movement. If the moisture content of the wood is high, the wood will shrink as it dries out. And conversely, if the moisture content's low and it takes on moisture, it's gonna swell. When it shrinks across the grain right here, the angle of this miter is going to change. See, there's no wood up here at the long point, but there's, oh jeepers, there's like over 12 inches of wood right here at the, across the short point. So even if you cut a perfect miter, once the wood dries, the short points are going to open up and the miter will look terrible. Reinforcing miters with biscuits, splines, or a tenon in this case is a must. But it's nearly impossible to reinforce a miter in a solid wood raised panel that's over 12 inches wide. Molding dealers stock a huge variety of panel moldings, but if you're doing a small job and you want a custom look, you can always make your own panel moldings with just a router and a beading bit. All you have to do is bead two edges of a piece of 1x4 or a piece of 1x6, then rip those two edges off on your table saw and you'll have two sticks of molding. But you can also get some really nice panel molding by ripping other moldings. I'll get two different panel molding profiles by ripping this one piece of Windsor 1 panel molding. I'll end up with a really small half inch bead molding from this end right here. It'll have a really kind of a neat tight uh, thumbnail cove to it right here. And from this rip on the back, I'm going to end up with a profile that'll sit proud of the face frame. Perfect. It's a lot easier to cut panel molding with the long point edge facing you instead of up against the fence the way you would if you were cutting casing. Now the long point would be against the fence and the short point would be out toward me. This way I can see the blade and take it right to the measurement mark. And I can use the same repetitive stops for both these moldings, even though the profiles aren't the same, because I'm cutting to the long points, but also because these are the same, these moldings are the same width. I'm going to set up these repetitive stops right now. I've cut this piece with a miter on one end, and I'll cut a miter on this end of this molding now. So I can cut duplicates as I go. I'm going to slide my zero clearance fixture so that it's flush with the right end of the saw and that'll line me up with the kerf for a left hand miter. So I'm all set to cut the left hand miters. Let's pull this smaller piece up, the more delicate one, and I'll pull a measurement on here. We want that to be 13 inches, so I'll make my mark right there. And I'll pass my saw right through that measurement mark. I wanted to get that right on, and I'll put a little measurement mark right back here, a repetitive stop mark. I can't put a repetitive stop into here, so I'm just making a mark right on my zero clearance fixture. And I can cut this next piece at that same length. So I have two of them. I have to swing my, slide my fence back, my zero clearance fixture back. And if you want to find out more about these fixtures, this is something that we covered in the last program in installing casing and baseboard. So check out that program and you'll see how to make one of these. All I'm going to do is cut a miter in each one of these again. You can see why that fixture is important. These little pieces, without it, the wind of the blade would catch these pieces. I 
and then they'd get caught up in the teeth and shoot out all over the place and they might ruin the miter that I'm cutting too. And you also notice that every time I make one of these cuts, I let the blade stop. So we got two more of those pieces to cut, but let's cut the long ones now. They're going to be 19 inches. We'll set up a repetitive stop for them too. So I'll measure out 19 inches. Make a fine mark here. Pull my saw in the opposite direction. So we'll drop the blade down here and make this cut right to the middle. And now for this piece, I'll set a repetitive stop up at this end. Just slide that right up to the piece here. There we go. Let me check that. Oh, it could come a little further. There we go. So now I can cut the next one too. I'll cut the next four pieces the same way, and then we'll have all the pieces we need. Now we've got all the pieces cut for both panels, and we'll go to the assembly table and put them together. I like to pre-assemble these small moldings too. It's a lot easier to get the miters tight. And if they don't fit inside the opening, inside the panel openings, and they're a little bit too big, I can always plane off the back of them just a hair with a low angle block plane. Now this delicate one here, I'm going to use 2P10 to put together, and the thicker one, I'm going to use spring clamps and a pin nailer to fasten the miters. First thing I'll do is I'll put a little glue on these corners. I'll glue these up, just a dab of glue on each one. I'll put my little spring clip right in the back here, just a little bit of it. That's going to help a lot. It'll hold that miter perfectly flush while I shoot this nail. There we go. So that frame's set. I'm going to put this next to the paneling. And now let's do the second one. And this one I'm going to put together with 2P10 glue. So I really want to get my ducks in a row here. And what I'll do is I'll put a little bit of glue onto both ends of the shorter piece. And I'll do the same with this short end. I'll spray the long ends and keep the spray away from my hand and away from the other pieces. This glue dries so quickly. And we'll put these together right here. This adhesive is made by FastCap. They call it 2P10 because it's a two-part glue and dries in 10 seconds. I've already told you that. When the bottle's fresh, it'll probably dry in two, and when it's a little older like this one, it dries like in 15 seconds. If you're the type that likes to play with your hair or pick your ear, make sure you buy the debonder too. You'll thank me. Okay, that one's set up. Let's get this next one. And even though the, even though the um, activator is flashed and it's no longer visible, I mean it doesn't look like the end is wet, it'll still set off that glue very quickly. And now we'll put these on top of those raised panels and see what they look like. So you'd want to put some liquid nails behind these panels, of course, and put them into place. And I'll just put a nail or two. We'll get them in. And then the molding goes in. And I cut these fairly tight, I think. So, yeah, it just fits. 
Yep. You can see there's a little bit of a fillet on the back of each one of these pieces of molding, on the back of this profile and on the back of this profile, which is one of the reasons I like these moldings. That fillet can be kissed right up tight to the style and it creates a really nice decorative edge, a beauty line. I'm going to do the same thing on this one. Oh, this one looks a little tighter even. Yeah, this looks even tighter. I think I'll take just a hair off of this. If they are a little snug, like I said, I'll just back it up against this board here. Now I think I'll get it to go in. Yeah, I might have to take a hair off the side here too. Yeah, I'll take a little bit off the side here too. Nice, perfect fit. So it's really easy to fit them after you've got them lighter together. And look, see the differences between these two profiles? This one's actually a little bit proud of the styles and rails here. If you're using veneered MDF for a stain grade job, this profile covers the entire edge, so you don't have to worry about having the MDF exposed. And the smaller one here is nice too. It's not proud, it's definitely recessed. And you can mill a profile that looks just like sticking on true cope and stick wainscoting if you want to as well. Bob Carney, a frequent contributor to the JLC finished carpentry forum, used that technique on his wainscoting. He milled a thumbnail panel molding that mirrors the sticking on traditional cope and stick joinery. While we're looking at these photographs, notice how Bob did a fine job of laying out and centering the gang switches in the first upper panel and how each corbel is balanced on top of a style. Bob cut the corbels and the decorative plates for each corbel too. The molding isn't coped either. It's mitered around the bottom of each corbel. The sticking around each panel is also mitered. Even a close inspection doesn't reveal the simplified technique. Bob's wainscoting also exemplifies a good turn-of-the-century home, a transitional period between Victorian and craftsman styles. Victorian homes were frequently decorated with tall wainscoting, capped by a plate rail. That plate rail height might also mark the top of a mantelpiece, as seen in this photograph from the curator's home at Fairbanks House in Massachusetts. If this home had wainscoat paneling, it would have flanked the sides of this mantel right to the height of the plate rail. This home was a Sears Craftsman kit. The mantelpiece was purchased at the time as an extra. The curator showed me the receipt for the mantel, a $10 extra. I suspect the wainscoting would have cost a lot more, maybe $15. Here's another example of an arts and crafts plate rail. This one from Andy Engel's home in Connecticut. Some of you might know Andy. He's a past editor of Fine Home Building Magazine. Notice how Andy installed the plate rail at the same height as the tall windowsills. Yes, the height of the window is extremely important if you want to achieve architectural integrity with your interior trim designs. Andy also used small corbels to support the plate rail and emphasized the corbels supporting the mantelpiece. Tall wainscoting is attractive in single panel or double panel styles. Bob Carney used a really small top panel in his arts and crafts home. In earlier Victorian homes, the top panel is often larger. In this modern Victorian home, beadboard decorates the lower panels while the upper panels are flat. These panel styles can be reversed too, with beadboard installed in the upper panels. Since we're talking about Victorian and arts and crafts styles, paneling that it reaches at least to the plate height. Let's build a craftsman style frame that's a little unusual. I made a mantelpiece using this design a few years ago. I borrowed the idea from the Gamble House out in Pasadena, California, one of the green and green homes. This is really a good way to develop design ideas and customize your work without going out on some architectural limb. Visit historic homes. Take photographs. If they won't let you take pictures, do quick sketches of the details so that you can replicate or borrow those ideas later. I always liked the sunray patterns in the doors and windows at the Gamble House. This is one of the screen doors on the home. The two center styles are sun rays. 
The thin rail beneath, cut higher in the center, is a cloud lift design. The sun rays and the styles look as if they're angled down and about to pierce the cloud lift rail. You can see the same design in this window on the rear of the Gamble House. The rail is elongated and thin, and the sun ray styles are also thinner. The proportions of the trim are important to note. In the boys' bedroom, the sun rays are used as styles in the upper door panels. Here's a closer view. See how the proportion of the upper styles matches the size of the lower styles? That makes it appear even more like the sun rays are piercing the lock rail. I saved this photograph for last because it's exactly the effect I'd like to achieve with the paneling, an even more dramatic design with three sun rays in the middle of the wall. This wall is a lot wider than a screen door, and the styles and rails I'm using are mostly one by four, so the proportions are going to be much different from those screen doors. In order to get the panel and the proportions just right, I drew the frame and the styles in SketchUp. SketchUp is the perfect tool for testing out design ideas, and it's also the perfect tool for creating working drawings for nearly every project, from a simple box to an elaborate mantelpiece. In this drawing, I made sure that the end styles were continuous, from the bottom rail to the top rail. The center styles break at the mid rail. I was able to experiment in the drawing with the sunray styles, both in their width at the widest point near the top rail and in the space between them. I knew the bottom of those styles should match the width of the styles below. By zooming in on the drawing, we can determine the exact detail of the angled sun rays too. The angle at the center is 5 degrees off 90, tapering up and away from the center style toward the top rail. The angle on the outside of the sun ray is 15 degrees tapering up and away from the center style toward the top rail. Using the dimension tool in SketchUp, I can see I'll have to take this style out of a piece of 1x8. 1x6 won't be wide enough. While you were watching all those pictures, I put together the outline for this frame. I've got all the lower styles and panels in, and I've got this center style in too. All I have left to do is put the sun rays in, and actually I've cut them, and they fit in just like so, so you can see exactly what we're up to here. We'll have to drill these for pocket holes, but let me show you how I cut these on a miter saw. They've got to be 13 inches tall, so I'm going to make a mark right here at 13, and I'll cross cut this piece. Let me swing this around so the mark's on my side. I've got more material to hold on to this way. You probably noticed I removed the accessory fences from my miter saw back here so that I could get a little bit further cut on this, a little bit wider cut because I'm going to be cutting in this direction now, ripping this piece with the grain. And it's a small piece, so I have this little jig here that we're going to use to hold this in place and secure it. Because I don't want to use my hand as a clamp. You know, when you put your hand onto something like that and you, and you use it as a clamp, that's like the death grip. When your hand is clamped to the piece, you cannot let go. So don't use your hand as a clamp. Make a quick jig like this. I'm going to take the saw and put it at 5 degrees right there. I'm going to make the first cut right to this point so it daylights out right there at the back of the board. It doesn't have to be perfect. There we go. Now the second cut I'm going to make at 15 degrees. So I'm going to put the saw right on the 15 degree detent right here. This cut also requires a measurement. 
it has to be two and three quarters of an inch where it meets up with the style, you know, where it looks like it's continuing the lower style. So I'll make a mark right there at two, two and three quarters of an inch. And I'll try my best to hit that mark with the blade. And that's our first piece. So we've just cut the 15 degree angle on this edge and we've got that 15 degree angle already on this off cut. So let's save that and I'll put that in the saw the other way, flip it around and I'll push the back of this board up tight against the miter saw fence so I can keep it square and then I'll clamp it down. Now remember I'm not keeping it tight against this fence because I want to keep this 15 degree angle. And now I want to cut a 5 degree angle on the rest of this. So I'll set the saw now at 5 degrees and this is a measurement too. I want to pull my tape out and put a mark at 2 and 3 quarters again to match that style width and do my best to hit that mark. Let me jump down here real quick and drill these pocket holes. lining up these holes and I'm using the fences sort of but not completely there we go and that'll give us a little structure in this thing now all we have to do is put these into place we've got our pocket screws in them I'm gonna glue these ends up this is just what we've been doing all along nothing different in this case, I'm just going to line up the top style so it follows the line of the bottom style. And I'll reach under here with my clamp and get that on there. Let me get that a little tighter. And remember, I can wiggle this around. I can adjust this just by sliding this clamp back and forth like so, just to put it right on the line where I want it. And this end can go wild. We don't have any marks for it. Nobody's going to be able to know if it's right on layout or not because of all the angles. Route out the inside of these panels and we'll be ready to measure for all the panels that'll go in. I'm 
I'm going to clip the corners in all of these regular ones like these and these. I'll clip all these corners, but in a few of these, like in here, I can't clip those corners. We'll be coming up too close to this angle right here. So I'm going to chop these corners out with a chisel. Softwood chops out pretty easily as long as you just take a little bite at a time. I'll get some of this out of here and then clean it up. I've got some material here that's already cut and I've ripped it to the width of the panel, just under, just an eighth of an inch under, so it just fits in. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I think I'll take it to the saw and I'll clip these back corners and then I'll set it back in here and I'll be able to trace the angled style here to make that last cut. can set this panel down in here so it's right where it's going to be in the back and it's right on on the sides and I'll take one of my pencils it's really sharp and I'll get underneath this panel right here and I'll trace that rabbit I'll run my pencil and I'll scribe that line several times because I'm drawing a line now on top of the pre-finished wood Sometimes it's hard to see. This should be the 15 degree angle, and it looks pretty close. I'll just go to the outside of this pencil line, and then we'll check the fit. That's going to be great. All I have to do is clip this corner down here, just a hair, just a hair. So let me do that real quick. There's one panel. Now let's get the next one in here. Set it in. You can never reach all the way to the back of the rabbit with your pencil. That's why when you cut the line, just leave the pencil line entirely and see how it fits. Perfect. So there's two that are done. I've clipped the bottom corners on these panels and ripped them and cross cut them so that they fit into the rectangular space. So all I have to do is the same thing again, get that sharp pencil and scribe them from the bottom. That should do it. Let's see if we left some lines on here. Yep, pretty thick, but we'll just stay on the back side of these. Leave the whole pencil line just to be safe. Now that should fit. Very nice, great. One more. Yep, great. Now we can glue all these in and staple them in place.
Bye bye. Four. Looks good. Well, this panel's finished. All I have to do is clean off all my tools, pick it up, move this vacuum out of the way, tear this old one off the wall, and we'll be ready to put this in. Get it in there tight to the corner. Let's move that plinth block back out of the way. Now let's see how this back band works. Oh, that's going to fit nice now, all the way to the bottom. Let me mark the top of this. And that's the bottom of the chair rail too, so all I have to do is cut this off and I'm ready to go. So I want to get this back pan in here before I do anything. Just wiggle it back and forth. Boy, that couldn't be tighter. to the wall. That'll hold it still for a little while. And that's pretty much all there is to a Craftsman, or kind of a custom looking Craftsman wainscoting at plate rail. Now what we want to do is put a piece of chair rail on top of here, and I'm going to get that piece right now. Once again, I've done the same thing I did with the chair rail underneath the window here. I've mitered this end, and I've put a self-return on it. And in this end here is a butt joint, so it's going to butt up against that wall right there, like so. And this end here is going to lap over this casing and I've allowed just enough room here for the bullnose to come on top of the casing too. This is a different style of, of stool. It has a little bullnose on it and really doesn't belong in a craftsman style. I should have used the square sticking like I did over here, the square edge, but I wanted to do something a little different. And on this one, since it's up higher in the air, it'll be easier for everybody to see. I want to play around a little bit with just a few little different twists with the chair rail styles. So all I have to do here is mark this notch at the casing, and I'll scribe that real quick. Now I'll cut that with a jigsaw. Let me take that line and transfer it across the back of this, that shoulder cut. And this one I think I can follow, but I'm going to continue it anyway. And you can see it's just a hair cockeyed. It's not quite perfectly square. But that's what you pick up with your scribes. Now we'll make this cut. And we may need that again. Let's see if this fits. There we go. Hey, that fits pretty well. And the wall is really pretty straight. We got lucky. We don't have to subscribe it to the back of the wall too. So I'm going to grab a nail gun and I'll just tack this down real fast. I'm just going to push it hard against the wall. There we go. All right. Now, I want to look at chair rail designs here. We've got a different kind of a pattern going on here, a bullnose. When I rip this stool, 
I allowed for this bull nose, plus I left enough meat underneath here for an additional three quarters of an inch. Remember, we've been putting cove molding on the other stool, on the other stool, so we have room here for a three quarter inch cove, plus oh, about a half an inch of reveal in addition to that. We're not going to put a piece of cove molding on here, though. Let's put on something a little different. I did this mantel piece not too long ago, and they wanted some fluted trim on the top of the mantel right across the entablature, right up near the ceiling at the cornice. And um, we thought we were going to have to have a wood carver or something carve the fluting. But we found some casing that uh, works out really well if you want to make something look like a really nice fluted strip across the top of a mantelpiece, and I've been itching to use this stuff on a piece of Wayne's cutting. This is my chance. I had these two pieces left over, and I've already ripped them down. And what I did was I just ripped the shoulders off this casing, and it's just fluted casing, and I ripped the shoulders off both sides so I could stick these pieces right up against each other, and I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to take this material, and I'm going to cut a bunch of little pieces. And I think I'll make these two, oh, let's, I think two inches will be a little bit too big. So I'll make these an inch and three quarters. I built that frame over there with a one by six top rail, knowing I was going to do something weird there, but I didn't know exactly what. And with that one by six top rail, I should have plenty of room for about an inch and three quarters, inch and three quarter of fluting. So I'll run that stop up to there and clamp that down, because I'm going to cut a whole bunch of these. And I want them to be all exactly the same size. All right. Usually you have to wait and let the blades stop before you pull the pieces out, right? But we're going to cut maybe 50 of these. So let's find out why, right now what happens if we pull the blade up. It might get carried up into the saw, and it might not. We'll see. Nope, look perfectly safe, so let's cut them quickly. We got a lot of those to cut. we should have to do. I changed nail sizes on this gun too. I slipped in some inch and three eighths long brads. You can tell the difference between the brads and the headless pins. First you can feel the little head on these and if you look really close with a magnifying glass you can probably see it too. But another way to tell the difference between a brad and a headless pin is the brads don't have arrows on them like the headless pins have. If you look at the headless pin nails, you'll see they've got little arrows on them. You see the arrow on that? It's pointing down toward my finger here. That's the direction you want to load it in the gun, so the arrow is pointing down. You always want to be careful about how you load these nails, and definitely when you've got the brads, be sure that you put the heads up. They don't fire too good when you put them in upside down. So we'll just take this little piece of cove molding, and we'll tack it right there. I'll grab a few more of these until they're falling out of my bags. Let's see how the fit is. Oh, it's not too bad. I'll tap that up until it's tight. This is paint grade. We'll be able to get that caulked or sanded out with a little glue in it. There's another one. Yeah, there's a little fuzz on there. That'll help us sand those little corners out. And another one. And what I've got planned, let me put a couple more on here. What I've got planned is to put some kind of a band underneath those two, a three quarter inch band. This is such a cool way of dressing up chair rail. You know, you can put anything underneath chair rail like this. It was supposed to be, you know, with this style, Windsor 1, 
their molding catalog shows a cove mold underneath this stool. This is a bullnose stool and it fits with their uh, Greek Revival style and I think one of the other styles too. And they show a cove molding underneath it. You can put the cove molding underneath it. You can put dental molding underneath it. This is a detail I saw in Chicago. I was touring some buildings, one in particular that Lewis Sullivan did, and I noticed that there was this fluted detail right underneath the chair rail on a high wainscoting. It was about this height. Actually, the building had a vaulted ceiling. I think I've got a picture of it, and I'll show it to you right now. This is the Roosevelt University Library, located on the 10th floor of Lewis Sullivan's Auditorium Building in Chicago. The Auditorium Theater downstairs is supposed to be the highlight of the building, but I sure get a kick out of this room. Sullivan had the courage to use a classical dado interpretation on these columns, which aren't really columns. They're imposts from the ceiling beams. See, they're not plumb because they're radial. The wainscoting design, like all of Sullivan's intricate work, is imaginative. I'm a Finnish carpenter, not a woodcarver, so I couldn't replicate the repeating coin pattern or the carved fret and dental details, but seeing this design changed my whole approach to decorating chair rail. The possibilities are unlimited. So I thought I'd pick up that same kind of an idea here, and that's what I'm doing. We'll just butt each one of these pieces into the next. I'll put another one on right here. And yeah, you should put this on with some glue. It would really help. And we can trim the bottom of it. I took another, just a real quick, I took another piece of one by and chamfered the two edges so it looks just like the back band. And you could take this and put it directly underneath this. And you can see the look you'd have where the flutes come down and, and terminate against this chamfered edge. It would look pretty cool. Makes a really nice solid looking chair rail. A really the whole piece becomes one, so it looks like one piece of molding, one, one profile, and it has that real solid, heavy look of mass, massiveness at the top of the, of the wainscoting, which is really something that the craftsman style is known for. Well, <laughs> I better stop right there. I still have a way is it to go to reach that corner. And you're probably getting anxious to get started with your own wainscoting project. I want to thank all of you for caring enough about our trade and wanting to improve your craftsmanship enough to invest in educational programs like this one. I hope you got a lot out of this program. I sure enjoyed making it. Keep your eye on my website for future programs in the on-site productions home building series and cut carefully. Now I'm gonna get back to work and finish this up. If you want to learn more about wainscoting, visit my website and order Wainscoting Program 8, Advanced Techniques. In that program, with Jed Dixon, I cover stairs and cope and stick joinery, among other things. I want to thank the following carpenters who contributed to this project. Without their photographs, advice, and suggestions, this program would not have been possible. Jed Dixon, Greg Burnett, Larry Katz, Charles and Tom Nego, Andy Engel, Jim Chestnut, David Collins, Harvey Rothman, Jeff Burks, Robert Carney, Marco Fee, Ron Roth, R.J. Davison, Daniel Parrish, Jesper Cook, and for all the carpenters I've sadly forgotten to mention, I blame my age. I want to also thank the following corporations who care about education in our industry and who make this whole series possible. Windsor One, green from tree to trim. Stabila, always trust, never adjust. Festool, faster, easier, better. Fastcap, saving valuable time. Craig Tool Company, building innovations. Kadex, better tools.